thank you everyone for staying on. This is the last session of the um, conference and I am pleased to moderate um, this panel consisting of papers to be presented by two of the region's most diligent, most active, and sharpest uh, scholars. Uh, I will say, I won't say they're the most promising because they have, I think, delivered on that already. So, um, on that promise. So, uh, the first speaker is uh, Eugene Seng. Uh, Eugene Seng is a senior curator at the National Gallery Singapore and will soon teach at the uh, National University of Singapore. So please help me welcome to the podium uh, Eugene Seng. Um, thank you, Patrick, for your um, very kind introduction. And um, I would also like to thank um, the Taipei Fine Arts Museum, as well as the Spring Foundation and um, Professor Chang Po Sing for inviting me and giving me an opportunity to share um, some of my ongoing research um, on the history of exhibitions in Southeast Asia. So my paper focuses on the birth of a new exhibitionary mode, the critical exhibition that emerged and proliferated across Southeast Asia in the 1970s. More importantly, it traces the turn towards the everyday with new modes of representation in art discourse, materiality and image making as gears that turned the wheel of the everyday, marking a conceptual shift propelled by critical exhibitions. It traces the exhibition histories of the region and locates the emergence of the critical exhibition out of the Cold War context that resulted in student protest movements, rapid industrialization, internationalism, and emerging nationalisms. So the critical exhibition marked a shift towards the conceptual, the assembly of everyday objects, the dissolution of the white cube into public spaces like the streets, a desire for participatory and social engagement, and a consciousness of the need to explore Euro-American notions and categories of art centered on a turn to the everyday. Critical exhibitions differed from previous types of exhibitions um, known in the region, such as the salon exhibitions, national, regional, and internationalist type exhibitions, as earlier, earlier forms of modernist exhibitions primarily focus on displaying art as autonomous artworks detached from the realities of the outside world that does not come in. So the title of um, my paper, The Descent to the Everyday, references Miyakawa Atsushi's influential text titled Anti-Art, Descent to the Everyday, that was, that was published in 1964, that explains the shift towards the rupturing of barriers between art and everyday life when artists in Japan began to use junk and other non-art materials in their works in the 1960s. For Miyakawa, and I quote him, the descent to the everyday is nothing other than the annihilation of the border between art and non-art, unquote. Anti-art was not non-art as it only sought to, and I quote him, recover a fundamental structure of the actual world through everyday objects, signs, and vulgar images, unquote. It marked a contemporary turn that consistently seeks to abandon the detached realm of the modern artwork by descending to the level of everyday life as an elusive goal that it can never attain. This paper argues that a similar descent to the everyday manifested in the art discourses, materiality, and imageries occurred in Southeast Asia and um, the critical exhibitions that emerged in the 1970s. Art historian and curator Ahmad Mashadi, um, he wrote an article that sought to reframe the changing artistic practices in the 1970s, um, brings our attention to, um, and I quote him, the context of social and political transformation in the region within which developments in prevailing artistic practices and conventions took place. The tenor or intensity of such conditions varied across locations, yet they broadly informed the emergence of artistic discourses marked by newer attitudes towards the role of artists and art, as well as the constitution, as well as um, art's constitution, the materiality of art, and the considered references made to society and notions of publicness." Unquote. So references to shifts in changing attitudes to the role of artists in society, 
publicness, materiality, and arts constitution are important markers identified by Mashadi as he focused his attention on artistic practices in his article on reframing the 1970s. The turn to the everyday in the 1970s could be conceived as an aesthetics of decolonization that searched for alternative modes of representing the realities of, everyday, of the everyday. A close examination of artworks displayed in critical exhibitions seek to make visible how a turn to the everyday within the context of internationalism ch challenges the simplistic binary between realism, focused on the figure, and representation against conceptual practices and abstraction that mirrored um, the ideological struggle in the, um, of the Cold War. Instead, a shift towards investigating the materiality, the material of the everyday became the heartbeat of emerging conceptual practices that returned to local contexts and histories that intersected with the three trajectories of um, internationalism, of, of internationalism, which are the real, abstraction, and the conceptual. So this paper will foreground the turn of the every, everyday as a form of consciousness that manifested in critical exhibitions. A shared desire to attend to the realities of the everyday um, and generate new representational forms that counter and make visible the dominant social, cultural, and political structures of the real world was itself, there was itself changing, translated into an aesthetics of decolonization using the material of everyday life to foreground the world as, as a sensual and mental experience. The urgent need to register contemporaneity as a radical experience located at the level of the everyday, of, of everydayness, makes, makes the familiar unfamiliar, to make visible social practices, uh, to transform daily life, um, to reclaim public spaces for social change, and to raise the consciousness of the people to seek alternative ideas and models outside Euro-American systems of thought. Together, the critical exhibition attends to the everyday as moments of critique in the process of decolonization that started in the 1970s as a process of defamiliarizing the routine in everyday life as a form of resistance against the experience of modernity as routine, repetition, bureaucratic, and capitalistic. The critical exhibition that embraced the everyday by making strange what otherwise goes unnoticed is transformed into a site for resistance to reorder power relations and challenge fixed hierarchies as a vehicle in the process of decolonization that intersects with new modes of representation. The critical exhibitions in the 1970s that this paper examines include um, the 1974 a documentation of experiences initiated jointly by Reza Piedasa and Sulema Issa in Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur, the Karikan Sinirupa Baru in Indonesia in 1975, and the Billboard Cutout exhibition by the Artist Fund of Thailand in 1976. So I'll, I'll primarily look at these three critical exhibitions um, due to the limitation of time. Um, so the modern in Southeast Asia was propelled by forms of abstraction and realism that engaged with broader international trends in the world. While abstraction embodied desires for progress to replace previous conservatism, realism appealed to the depiction of present realities and conditions of the present for social change. Both abstraction and realism form part of the larger international confluence of cultural debates shaped by Cold War ideologies captured in Claire Holt's very important book, The Great Cultural Debate, one of our chapters in the book, um, between the Bandung School in Indonesia, labeled as, and I quote, Laboratory of the West, unquote, by Trisna Sumajo, and realists from Yogyakarta in Indonesia, led by artists like S. Suryono, who believe that Art is the expression of um, Jiwa Kotok, or the visible soul of the artist who, who inevitably expresses his or her national culture and emotions in their, in their art. While similar cultural debates occurred across the region in the 1960s, the institutionalization of abstraction and realism began through the establishment of art societies organized by artists propagating abstraction and the universal, such as the Modern Art Society and the Alpha Gallery in Singapore, Sang Tao, or the Creation Group in Vietnam, the Galangang Group in Indonesia, and their opponents who gravitated towards realism, like the Equator Art Society in Singapore, and, the, um, and Lekra in Indonesia, or the Lembaga, Lembaga um, Kembudayan Rakyat, or Lekra in Indonesia, and the Kai Sahan, or Solidarity in the Philippines. The Cultural Center of the Philippines, or the CCP, established by Marcos regime, 
the Birasri Institute of Modern Art or BIMA in Bangkok and the Taman Ismail Mazuki in Jakarta are examples of art institutions built as sites where the pulse of internationalism could manifest in engagement with the national that also yearned for international recognition. These institutions provided spaces for experimental interdisciplinary practices, including modes of abstraction and other international art movements regarded as progressive and therefore coherent with the authoritarian regimes that promoted developmentalism to generate economic prosperity in Indonesia. Under Suharto's new order, for example, um, Tanom uh, Kitikachon's military rule in Thailand and uh, Ferdinand, 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 Ferdinand Marcos's um, martial law in the Philippines. So progressive art was therefore conceived and supported by these authoritarian regimes to construct and project a democratic, liberal, and open international face to the global community of nations aimed primarily, primarily at the West. Understanding the confluences of abstraction against realism in a period of intensifying international and run, internationalism runs the risk of constructing a simplistic binary opposition yoked to the logic of the Cold War. Abstraction was not necessarily conceived as art for art's sake that celebrated the unfettered autonomy of art, um, uncritically detached from reality. Art critic and realist and an and artist, uh, Rodolfo um, Perez, uh, Rod Perez, Perez argued that, and I quote him, the one constant factor in this stylistically protean scene lies in a concerted move from the illusionistic realism towards the actual reality a stress on pigments and gestures on painting rather than a subject of theme, or theme, unquote. Painting the modern in the Philippines remained grounded in reality while negating the illusionistic impulses of realism. The notion of reality itself was claimed by both realism and gestural paintings with sympathies with art informal and other forms of abstraction. The real becomes a contested terrain that cannot be separated from the notions of everyday life and its realities that artists, whatever their ideological art or artistic inclinations. What was at stake was a representational mode, whether abstraction, plasticity, or illusionistic realism most suited to depicting the realities of the everyday. Realism as the representational mode was advocated by the Kai Sahan from the Philippines as a way to depict the everyday life of the Filipino people and also seeks to change their lives by uplifting it through art, clearly articulated in their art manifesto. And um, I quote um, the Kaisa Han, um, and, and I start from here, but we wish to gradually transform our, life, our art that has a form understandable to the masses and a content that is relevant to their life. We shall therefore develop an art that not only depicts the life of the Filipino people, but also seeks to uplift their condition. We shall develop an art that enables them to see the essence, the patterns behind the scattered phenomena, and the experience of our times. We shall develop an art that shows the unity of their interests, and thus leads them to unite." Unquote. The Kai Sahan sought to make visible the otherwise invisible patterns of everyday life through realism as a mode of representation that is transmissible to the masses to awaken their consciousness and unite them for action. They, they were not alone. The artist front of Thailand that Claire mentioned earlier um, produced an art manifesto as well along similar lines, declaring that, and I quote, the artist front of Thailand's promotion on the valuable cultural um, art could help the little people develop their ethnicity to fight the injustice in society. All in all, to develop the whole nation and society, the basics of life, um, i.e. politics, economics, education, and culture, art must be correctly and relatively promoted." Unquote. So the artist's front of Thailand's call for the basics of life was a return to the everyday and its structures in the social, political, economic, education, and art. It is the structures and conditions of the everyday that needs to be changed from the bottom up rather than top down. And art was seen to, to play an empowering role for social change. The contestation over the real in every day and how it was to be represented took a different articulation in Indonesia over the Maya or the illusory world and the concrete. Art critic Sananto Yuliman explains this in relation to his defense of the artists and artworks of the Karekan Sinupa Baru or um, New Art from Indonesia exhibition and it's worth examining closely. But in the interest of time, I will only focus on 
um, the parts that have been it italicized, and I will start my quote from there, which is the, the last um, sentence, or the, rather the last paragraph. Earlier generations of artists were satisfied with works that were bound by the imaginative experience and reflections into an inner realm. Artists participating in this exhibition step out of these constraints, aggressively moving into the outside realm, the concrete world, as if aiming that art can provide an experience which is full and total, unquote. So the representation of the concrete world using concrete objects found in everyday life is proposed as a new aesthetic experience, a sense of concreteness to shock the viewer through the use of um, concrete objects that are banal, everyday materials, as opposed to the illusory world drawn from the artist's inner realm. Concreteness as a shift from the interior imaginations of the artist to the exterior concrete materiality of the banal, such as crates, cushions, um, and other objects that you know, we are familiar with in everyday life, are now transformed into artworks. The aggressive shifting of these concrete artworks into the outside realm, the realm of the, the world of the everyday, was to manifest in the materiality of art. So the use of everyday non-art materials to make artworks expanded the restricted use of what was considered art materials as oil and watercolor to, be, to found objects and even ready-mates that embody local symbolic, cultural, and political meanings. FX Asuno, one of the leading artists of the Gurukhan Sinipabaru, proposed the term semi-contextual, or contextual art, and semi penyadaran or awareness art, as a conceptually strategy that draws on local materials imbued with culturally specific meanings to make art objects is um, remarkably different from conceptualism in Euro-America. The notion of conceptual art, contextual art, is connected to a literary movement that occurred simultaneously um, and is called contextual literature, or sastra contextual in Bahasa Indonesia, that sought to foster a socially engaged literary discourse to challenge the formal structuralist and universal humanist literary discourses that were manifestations of depoliticized literary production in Indonesia and across the rest of Southeast Asia. American art critic Lucy Lippert introduced the term dematerialization in conceptual art in 1967 as a reduction of material in art making, uh, in, sorry, a reduction of material in art making to reduce art to its purest form such that it will only exist as an ethereal concept. The dematerialization of art was a rejection of the material construction of art for the conceptual production and dissemination of ideas, a dominant conceptualist movement from 1966 to 1972 in Euro-America. However, dematerialization of art did not occur uh, in the shift towards the conceptual in, in, in Indonesia. Instead, it rematerialized everyday objects by making strange and defamiliarizing de them from their usual context and functions, and reassembling new meanings that reveal the hidden structures of power and control over the rakyak, or people. Um, I will now focus on some of the works that were shown in the Gerakan Sinirupa Baru. For example, um, Encheng Gondok by Siti Adiati, one of the few women artists from the Gerakan Sinirupa Baru, that was shown in the 75 exhibition, was the only work that used a living organism the ancient gondok, or a type of water hyacinth, and an invasive species originally from the Amazon basin, now commonly found in the region. Amidst the water hyacinth are plastic golden roses to contrast between art and artifice, to provoke audiences to think about the delicate balance in the relationship between humans and nature. Bringing a living organism uh, into the Garikan Sinupabaru exhibition also collapses the mean, the bridges, or collapses the bridges, or also bridges the gap between art and non-art and recontextualizes both the water hyacinth as a kind of floating aquatic plant and the weed due to its high reproduction rate caused by agricultural waste from polluting rivers and lakes by raising its nutrient levels commonly found in Indonesian villages that could also destroy aquatic life. So Siti Adiati recontextualizes the water hyacinth as a potentially environmentally harmful weed and the plastic golden roses um, by revealing that Suharto's new order, that purported developmentalism, is just an illusion symbolized by the golden rose in the sea of absolute poverty that the ancient Gondok represents. This is why the ancient Gondok is included in the art movement of the Gurukhan Sinupabaru. That is my point to understand everyday life. This is a quote from Siti Adiati. So Siti's approach to use the real problems and issues of everyday life through the water hyacinth that is recontextualized from both a harmful weed embedded with potentialities um, that, is, that could also be useful 
um, but however, never realized within the current social and political structures created by Suharto's new order. Towards a mystical reality in 1974, sanctified in Malaysia, sanctified ordinary daily objects, and some of which, like city Adiati's ancient gundo, was also an organic material, such as human hair, a live potted plant, a chair that is shown as it is, and two Coca-Cola bottles that are also half consumed. Placing these everyday objects on white pedestals in a white cube gallery space, as you see here, immediately prompts the viewer to appreciate these everyday objects formally as sculptural artworks, but draws from the Taoist philosophy of experiencing the works as events, or as Christian Jit, an, an art critic articulates, and I quote him, as life situations, rather than static and physical material objects. The handwritten label for one of the works um, which is titled, Randomly Collected Sample of Human Hair Collected from a Barber Shop in Pataling Jaya. Pasted on the pedestal itself prompts the viewer to look beyond the apparent valueness and, um, of the organic hair that will be discarded as an ephemeral found object to enter a mental rather than a rational space. The viewer shifts from relying on seeing with the retina with scientific observation as a framework in which to appraise the found object to being a participant participant who enters a live situation using the found object as an event-centered entry point to think about um, who the hair came from, did this person live in Pataling Jaya, for example, and what can the hair tell us about the person? The value of the found object transformed, tra transformed from a material and capitalist basis to one that is experiential and based on lived everyday experience, experiences as another form of reality, as stated in the um, Towards a Mystical Realities Manifesto that, and I quote, there are alternate ways of approaching reality, and the Western empirical and humanistic viewpoints are not the only valid ones there are." Unquote. Returning to Miyakawa's idea of anti-arts return to vulgar images to recover the fundamental structures of the everyday world, Ken Dedes, uh, an artwork um, made by Jim Supangat, incited controversy when it was first shown in the New Art Movement in 1975 as he juxtaposed a cartoon graffiti rendition of the body of Candelis um, that was vulgarized by cladding it in a pair of unzipped jeans revealing her pubic hair to the spectator, while the head is based on the iconography of the revered Queen Candelis, wife of Ken Arok, who wrote the Sing Singhasari Empire in Java. It was believed that whoever married Candelis would, would be destined for kingship. So Candidus' sacred powers defined by her pure beauty and sexuality are given a vulgar reinterpretation by Jim Supanka. The meaning conveyed by the cartoon graffiti, part of Candidus' um, um, conveyed by the ca cartoon graffiti, adopts a system of depiction based on cartoons that juxtaposes with the sculptural head that conveys a different system of representation derived from Hindu Buddhist iconography. The combination of two different and incongruent systems of representation in one single work produces a new mode of representation that provokes the viewer to think critically about the different ways in which um, the real was represented across time and cultural co context. In 1974, the Artist Front of Thailand was formed in the immediate year after the toppling of um, Tanom uh, Kitty Kachon. Um, the Artist Front of Thailand opposed art that was produced for capitalism controlled by those in power and big businesses and called for art to be relevant to the common Thai worker and farmer to bring culture to every Thai. Exactly one year later, in October 1975, the Artist Front of Thailand organized a large display of paintings on Rajadaman Avenue with posters to commemorate the victory of the students that caused the military regime to collapse. The collaboration between artists, students, and ordinary Thai people to make these billboard cutouts um, that you see here, that were displayed out in the public space in the streets, um, transformed the everyday public space of Rajadaman Avenue, where the symbolic democracy monument, where many of the student protests, protesters, protesters gathered into a site of resistance. The artist front of Thailand was not alone in this, as the Kai Sahan similarly produced posters and murals against the Marcos regime. While Ken Dedes employed vulgar images from the urban everyday, the artist front of Thailand um, used billboard cutouts from its 1975 critical exhibition, um, adopted a different strategy by deploying politically charged images widely circulated in the media to awaken the consciousness um, of the people to the brutal, to the brutal and to the brutality and violence of the military regime. 
In this particular work that you see, uh, which is a remake of the original billboard cutout, the image of the Thai soldier in the midst of throwing a grenade was widely circulated through newspapers and television. This image of the Thai soldier who is about to throw his grenade alludes to the Thai military's violence against his own people and his participation in the Vietnam War, uh, when, where almost 40,000 Thai military volunteers fought against the Viet Cong in Vietnam. This image captured the growing resistance against American imperialist political intervention in Thailand to support the war effort in Vietnam. As a popular image of the war, it embodied a sense of contemporaneity in the resistance against American imperialism, which is in action, which is in the action like the grenade that is suspended mom momentarily in time, just about to be locked over the barbed wire towards the Thai national flag. The symbol of Thailand's independence and freedom that is depicted as being wrapped around what is likely or what looks like a coffin. The Thai national flag as a symbol of Thailand's unity and freedom is a symbol of a universal time that has not ceased as long as Thailand as a nation exists. The vulgarity of naked violence represented by the soldier momentarily clashes, this clashes with the sacredness of the Thai national flag and the golden bowl, which is now painted black, that you see in the background, a sacred object used in Thai Buddhist and royal ceremonies to hold offerings for sacred Buddhist relics that also holds the 1932 Thai constitution forged from the, from the coup of the same year. Like Candides, the vulgar of the everyday is doubly represented by the mass media image of the soldier and the violence of the military is matched by the double sacredness of the Thai people and the Thai constitution, making visible the complexities of the political and social everyday experienced by the Thai people in the 1970s under military rule. In conclusion, resonating with Miyakawa's notion of anti-art and its descent to the everyday, the ambassador and art critic Armando uh, Manalo described the 1970s in the Philippines as, and I quote, a period of metaphysical unrest, unquote. With the curatorial programs of the CCP from the 1971 to 1975 as the exposure phase of, and I quote, advanced art experimental in nature through the use of sand, junk, iron, non-art materials such as raw lumber, rocks, etc., were common materials for the artist's developmental strategies. People were shocked, scared, delighted, pleased, and satisfied, even if their preconceived notions of art did not agree with what they encountered." Unquote. The CCP under Raimondo Albano sought to provoke audiences by making strange the familiarity of the everyday that made one relatively aware of an environment suddenly turning visible. This is a quote from Raimondo Albano. The turn to the everyday propelled by critical exhibitions in the 1970s produced new modes of representation stemming discursively in notions of art and life and the concrete materiality in the use of non-art and ready-made objects, incorporating vulgar and popular images that destabilize the boundaries between the sacred and the profane and reclaiming public spaces like the street by turning it into a collaborative display between artists, students, and the public to make and install the billboard cutouts. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Eugene. The second speaker is Simon Soon. Simon is a researcher and senior lecturer in the Visual Art Department of the Cultural Center, University of Malaya. So please help me welcome uh, Simon Soon. Um, so, good evening, everyone. Um, uh, first of all, I would like to thank TFAM and the Spring Foundation. Uh, as well as uh, Jiang Lao Si for inviting me to participate in this uh, symposium. Um, so let me begin. In 1980, the very year when S. Durai Raja Singham donated his personal archive of documents, books, and materials on the renowned art historian and curator of Indian art, the late Ananda Kentish Kumaraswamy to the Jaffna Public Library he also published a commemorative book titled, What is This? Who is this Kumar Swami? The cover page features an ikwash rendition of a sketch by Bengal school painter Asit Kumar Halda, belonging to Raja Singham himself. It was based on an older sketch executed by the same artist during the latter's encounter, the latter's encounter with Kumar Swami around 1909 and to 1910. 
This image of Kumaraswamy on the cover page shows him in side profile, distinguished by the aquiline curve of his nose. He spots a turban fastened by a running band decorated by wavy lines. Representation of Kumarama Swami as an oriental mystique is conveyed through a number of references. Firstly, orientalist baseline reference to Greco-Roman classical equipoise, which projects far-sightedness, is captured in the profile view of the scholar. Secondly, the representation also draws on the schematic portrayal of the human form, common to traditional Indian court style. Kumaraswamy's sort of contour is rendered via economic means, using the barest of outlines. And then lastly, the portrait is affected with a gauzy wash of ink to hint at mystique, at the mystique of the Far East, by which the early 20th century became a creative resource in the formulation of a Bengal school of art through Rabindranath Tagore's close association with the Japanese aesthete Okakura Tenshin. So in choosing a sketch which hung in Raja Singham's studi uh, study named Ananda Kumaraswamy's home library and remain a cherished possession of Raja Singham uh, for the cover of the book Who is This Kumaraswamy, published in 1980, we could perhaps consider the deliberate choice of this sketch for the cover as an attempt on the part of Raja Singham to multiply the visibility of a personal relic through mechanical reproduction. But such practice also spells out a number of distinguishing features in the repertoire of Raja Singham's publishing enterprise, which this presentation attempts to provoke. The archive of Kumaraswamy by Raja Singham was painstakingly accumulated over many years since the Second World War ended. It was just as well that besides being a hoarder of Kumaraswamy memorabilia, Raja Singham, who was also of Sri Lankan Tamil descent, uh, was equally an avid publisher, self-publisher. Throughout his life, Raja Singham worked primarily as a secondary school teacher in a Malaysian town called Kuantan in the state of Pahang. Nevertheless, from 1947 till around 1980, he had self-published a total of 15 books related to Kumaraswamy. These range from compilations of tributes to bibliographical index, from biographical sketches to anthologies of Kumaraswamy's writings. These publications are very often sort of like um, peppered with photographs and documents that Raja Singham had patiently accumulated over the years. As a self-publishing venture, the layout of the publication is often idiosyncratic, and they indicate a very hands-on process of selection, often guided by personal whims and fancies. Frequently, the only means of acquiring these materials that form the bulk of the published works was true male correspondences, for there was very little indication that Raja Singham traveled much uh, at all for his research. So the result was a, a real sort of hot, hodgepodge of ephemeras that came together neither as a lucid prose or a cohesive sort of like argument. Nevertheless, I would suggest that an argument does eventually emerge when we consider the output in relation to a kind of allegorical thinking that informed Raja Singham's sense of devotion that was central to his life work. Um, so as one of the later work, who is this Kumaraswamy published in 1980 with a limited print run of about 200 copies was conceived as a picture book to help explain to Raja Singham's four, years, four year old grandson uh, the lifelong obsession he had with Kumaraswamy. Uh, in his writing, Raja Singham, uh, Raja Singham likens the book to a film and suggests that it fulfills a desire towards generosity. For according to him, I quote him here, the visual approach can also present appreciation and values, unquote. But what did Raja Singham mean specifically about the visual in this instance? And in what manner is the visual generous? 
More importantly, what is the historiographical procedure of this book biography that is meant for a four-year-old? So to do so, uh, oh, this is the image that's, that's, that's the grandson that he was sort of writing to. So to do so, I guess, one needs to sort of consider who is this Kumaraswamy in relation to his sort of like prodigious sort of output. A significant feature in Raja Singham's publishing uh, method is a near cyclical recitation of historical details over and over again. As you can see here, he would sort of like copy from one book to another. These are two different books published in two, uh, in two different years. The books as mnemonic sort of like vehicles therefore offer permutations of the self-same ideal profile of Kumaraswamy. This is encapsulated in the phrase, uh, remembering and remembering again and again, a line that appeared in Kumaraswamy's sort of explication of a theory of Indian painting, which was later used as, a, as the title of a commemorative book uh, published in 1977 by Raja Singham. In this sense, both books and photographs are not only engineering diasporic sort of memory through technical reproducibility, they pattern the process as one of repetition and difference. The differences amount to a gradual stripping off Kumaraswamy of any individual foible that marks him as human and a calculated sort of like reinscribing of Kumaraswamy as a modern scholar saint. Conversely, the process mirrors a near sort of self-effacement of the author as a principal sort of like agent for someone who has expressed near total devotion to the life of Kumaraswamy, Raja Singham's own personal story was rarely brought up in his publications, except for a very short essay on how he came to learn of Kumaraswamy's writings in the introduction chapter to a 1977 book. In this instance, he attributes his recognition of Kumaraswamy's sort of global significance on a chance encounter on a train with a Japanese soldier during the Japanese occupation of Malaya, where the soldier was reading a copy of Kumaraswamy's The Dance of Shiva. Since then, in Raja Singham's reckoning, the publishing activity constituted a form of guru yoga, the spiritual exercise of sublimating the ego self through the installation of um, a, 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 a teacher as a principal sort of guide. Even so, the premise of this devotion is misrepresentation at best. Uh, the Kumara Swami appears in the pages as a de deified sort of like figure, master in numerous forms of accomplishments. Uh, central to this narrative is the transmutation of art into spirituality. So a chart prepared by Raja Singham even, even goes so far as to suggest some form of Hegelian correlation in which the principal philosophical goal was spiritual in nature. This exercise of even writing about art was sort of like spiritual in nature. For Raja Singham's plaintive devotion are less so acts of recalling than an exercise through which memory can be invented. His life work could therefore be seen as a quest to establish diasporic affinity with someone whom he has never met in person and only corresponded with very briefly. So on occasion, this could have caused, this would have caused Kumaraswamy some unease in the very brief moment when they corresponded. For example, in a, late, in a letter written around May uh, 1946, sent from the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, Massachusetts, Kumaraswamy castigates his self-professed disciple. He admonishes, and I quote here at length, I must explain that I am not at all interested in biographical matter relating to myself and that I consider the modern practice of publishing details about the lives and personalities of well-known men is nothing but a vulgar watering to illegitimate curiosity. So I could not think of spending my time, which is very much occupied with more important tasks, to hunting up such matter, most of which I have long forgotten and shall be grateful if you will publish nothing but the barest facts about me. What you should deal with is the nature and tendency of my work, and your book should be 95% about this. All is anika, anicca, or as the wisdom of India should have taught you, 
portraiture of human beings is asphaga, asphagia. All this is not a matter of modesty, but one of principle." Unquote. So to put it briefly, it should be noted that Kumaraswamy, who was shaped by the impulses of modernity and the neo Vedanta movement of the 19th century, understood the wisdom of India primarily through the lens of European Romanticism, nationalism, and the esotericism of theosophy that were popular at the time. The principle of universalism undergirding his discomfort at any form of hagiography was the result in large part of the need for Indian art and spirituality to prove itself to be just as focused on to be just as focused on transcendence as in comparison to its Euro European Judeo-Christian counterpart. The latter tradition was the fall which formed the basis of comparison that sharpened Kurama Swami's understanding of Indian art, not just as a domain of autonomous aesthetic contemplation, but one, but one which has at its foundation the recourse for a form of spiritual renewal that would have universal resonance and appeal to the modern world. Yeah. So on the other hand, Raja Singham saw Kumaraswamy in a very different light. It was clear that while he was drawn to Kumaraswamy's cosmopolitan, he was clear that while th that he was drawn to Kumaraswamy's cosmopolitan profile, this led to numerous declamations in which Raja Singham would profess his adulation uh, that can be understood as a sort of form of guru, guru yoga, as I mentioned before. For example, in the dedication piece to study of a scholar Colossus in 1977, uh, in the book Raja Singham would invoke uh, in the epigraph, I quote him here, may my work in Guru Dev's memory help to sustain through the years ahead so that my son, his namesake, will blend in the devotion with which I apply myself to this noble land. I shall not suffer for lack of work on Kumaraswamy, unquote. So, uh, guru Yoga, as a form of devotional practice, has tantric roots, whereby the practitioner aspires to identify with his teacher, and through the devotional process, obtain some spiritual benediction or awakening. What is suggested here is that Kumaraswamy was installed as the patron saint of the Sal uh, Saloni sort of Tamil, an iconic sort of cipher through which certain allegory of the condition experienced by the diaspora can be concentrated. Here I want to suggest that the personal archive of on Kumaraswamy that Raja Singham had patiently built in Malaya bore the hallmark of a kind of obsession. This obsession translates into a kind of diasporic sort of affinity that displaces a scholar like Raja Singham from any national art historical framework whether they are Sri Lankan or Malaysian or Indian. To make sense of Raja Singham's obsession, we must then pay closer attention to what is politically at stake in this historiographical project. If the publication of who is this Kumaraswamy can be understood as an act of spir uh, as a spiritual act, or guru yoga so to speak, Kumaraswamy's installation also necessitated the promotion of his virtues. Here, the scholar is distilled into a perfect form as each publication cumulatively produces this archetypal kind of image. By this account, the vehicle becomes also a means to distribute not only Kumaraswamy's work per se, but also Kumaraswamy's darshan. And darshan here refers to the vision of divinity that is bestowed upon the viewer who beholds a divine being or a revered person. It is a kind of blessing that is often imparted through the image form. Perhaps this is what is meant by Raja Singham in characterizing who is this Kumaraswamy as generous. If you recall, what this was the word that was used to describe the making of the picture book by Raja Singham. So in a sense, what the collection of photographs, charts, um, bibliographical sort of index hope to produce is a kind of visual benediction by way of allegory. Self-publishing was, in a sense, amenable to such an enterprise. One could suggest that Raja Singham's undertaking was a minor, was a kind of minor literature. And I use this in a Deleuzean sense of the term. For Deleuze, a minor literature speaks for a deterritorialization of language so that minority groups 
is urged by the impossibility of not writing to find one's voice within a terrain that is both familiar and alien. This in turn speaks of two other distinguishing characteristics that of a minor literature that the, a minor literature possesses both political and collective sort of resonance. Given the strained relationship between Sinhalese and the Tamils in Sri Lanka, the laborious construction of an intellectual lineage for a Tamil community then facing both political and cultural discrimination in Sri Lanka was expedient, if not also urgent. However, we consider here a work that speaks from within a community. It's when we consider a work that speaks from within an, uh, a community, its allegorical nature becomes central to the foregrounding of certain anxieties of modern life even if these are meant to convey civilizational grandeur in an operatic sort of scale. Observe the manner in which a torso of a yaksi, there on the top um, right corner, uh, is placed next to a Rajput painting. Or the photographs of traditional textiles and Indian architecture is juxtaposed against a quote uh, and, a, uh, and a portrait of uh, Kumara Swami that reads, I do actually think in both Eastern and Christian terms, Greek, Latin, Sanskrit, Pali, and to some extent Persian, and even Chinese, unquote. The imaginative leaps that Raja Singam condenses, that, that Raja Singam sort of like um, harness in order to condense the history of modernity, uh, is in some ways a kind of transhistorical and transnational kind of sleight of hand through the assembly of fragments. After all, according to Walter Benjamin, that which is allegorical stems from a realization that the world is no longer permanent, unlike the certainty offered by classicism in attempting to reconcile both divine order and the modern experience of flux Raja Singham's theology might appear reactionary or conservative since its recourse is towards the seeming stability of this classical tradition. Yet, I would argue by paying closer attention, we're able to see that the means of its delivery is wholly modern. The output represents a paradox that is seldom addressed in the study of modern art, which is the sustained search for a meaningful form amidst the anxiety of the modern age. And yet, I would argue that for Raja Singham, such form is always already recognizably in fragments, yeah, as we can see in the books, in the way he publishes those books. Um, and, and this sort of like fits into what the Benjamin sort of like idea of the allegory, that the past could only exist as a heap of ruinous sort of like fragments displaced into the present day as fetishes like a cubist collage, or a scrapbook, or the personal archive. It's very idiosyncratic. And what we see is an attempt to bring together that which is already sort of like broken. The publication sort of like eclectic array of memorabilia is simply a ruinous heap. A year after Raja Singham donated his materials on Kumara Swami to Jaffna Public Library in 1980, inter-ethnic tension worsened in the Jaffna Library. The result, this resulted in the burning of the library by an organized Sinhalese mob, resulting in the destruction of over 97,000 volumes of materials that made up the collection in 1981. In many sense, were it not for the publications, many of the documents and manuscripts related to Kumara Swami would have been irrevocably lost. As reproduction, the books and, library and publications provided a second life to some of these archival materials that have since been reduced to cinders. In the wake of such ruin, it would seem that Raja Singham's publications have in turn become a kind of archive in their own right. But they are more than archival, since what they amount to is a kind of thesis. If the invocation of the Delusian concept of minor literature is facetious, we might ask, can this kind of scholarship still emerge in today's world? How does writing characterize as work? How does writing characterize as work 
and under what condition can we qualify the labor of Raja Singham? Uh, uh, obsession over Kumaraswamy as a kind of historiography. Or more importantly, can the resolution and obsession that compel this kind of scholarship still emerge in our current times? The title, Who is this Kumaraswamy, is ultimately rhetorical. For one can only assume that the answers were already laid out in how the book is structured. But like the analogy to a film, to a film, made by Raja Singham, the publication is significant because it is also unlike the commonplace historiographical canon as the discipline was increasingly, as the discipline becomes increasingly sort of like professionalized. What the book contains are impressions that are fleeting and remind us of the illusory kind of nature of form. In turn, they shape a vernacular of iconosity that is modern in its departure from the icon iconometric sort of certitude of customary religious um, statuary. But then the image of the scholar saint would be built on very sort of like shifting foundations made up by modern means, photographs, texts, statistical charts, love stories, catalogs. These are things that shore up an image that is fragmented and fuzzy on the edge, yet arguably focused and sharp as a subject. What it relies on is the customary interpretive frame of remembrance as a means to produce social memory in an age of mechanical reproduction so that the use of history achieves some kind of social spiritual purpose. This purpose allows for a different kind of internationalism to emerge in a time of nation building. Aligning itself with the political imaginations of another place and another politics. In turn, what this globality signposts is that the diasporic affinity inhabits a time unto itself, um, enacting a kind of what, uh, presumably what I think Walter Mignolo would call a sort of epistemic disobedience, right, against prevailing forms of scholarship that has become mainstream in our history. And I was in fact struck by what uh, Xu Lao Si said yesterday about this kind of move beyond the archive as a sort of like um, epistemic sort of like project. And I think something is going on here in that direction, um, even though it's not necessarily about technology. I wonder if the possibility of this moment could also be extended with this example, since not only does it complicate our understanding of cultural and intellectual history of modernity. It demands our recovery of other modes in which history can be written, as well as to direct our attention to how histor historical resources can be activated to address uh, modern or contemporary concerns. Thank you. Hello. So thank you, Simon and Eugene, for very substantial papers. Uh, uh, the hour is late, so I'd like to open the, the floor for questions for both Simon and Eugene. So if there's anyone, uh, Claire, please. Hello. Oh, I had a question for um, Eugene, actually. Um, and thanks for two really interesting papers. Um, Eugene, I wanted to ask about um, the way in which these two of these exhibitions that you talked about have been reconstructed in recent times so towards a mystical reality the reconstruction of that and the inclusion of i think only two of the objects were actually from mm. the original the original iteration um, and also the artist front of thailand exhibition and the use of those cut out or the, the billboards in recent commemoration events uh, for 1973. What I think is or perhaps interesting in about the um, cut out example is the way in which those commemoration events have been kind of divided along two lines. Because in the original exhibition, when it was on um, Ratchadamnon Avenue, the king and the queen actually attended that exhibition and they, they laid down wreaths for the students who were, who were killed um, during 1973. Um, but now, 
the splitting of the commemoration events between the red and the yellow side. On, on the red side, there's that kind of erasure of the royal participation in that event and the construction of that exhibition as purely a, a radicalized kind of movement. And then on the yellow side, there's a kind of emphasis on that nationalistic element within within the um, within the original exhibition. So I was wondering if you could comment on both of those. Yeah, um, Claire, thanks for asking this question because it relates back to our topic of the, on the archive. Um, and I think there was an earlier question about remaking artworks, um, which also comes back to restaging exhibitions that um, produce many of these remade um, artworks as well. Um, so I will answer your question on the artist front first. Um, actually, I, I, had a, I had a discussion with um, Gritaya Gawi Wong um, just two weeks back um, about um, this remaking of um, the billboard cutouts um, because they are only one quarter of the actual size. So, uh, and uh, the, original, the original billboards were obviously like made from cardboards. Um, while the remates are all actually on canvas. Right? They're painted on canvas, so they're very different in that way. Um, it was a project undertaken by Project 304, which is why Gritaya Gawiwong was personally involved, because she was commissioned to, to um, bring the artist to repaint and remake um, these works. And um, as I understand from her, a good number of works that she, the billboard cutouts that were remade, were eventually not shown uh, in the memorial as you currently see it today, because there they, they were concerns about um, some of these works being too political, or some issues concerning um, how it was kind of depicting royalty and matters like that. So not all the works that were commissioned to be remade were actually eventually shown. Uh, which is unfortunate because it would be great to see um, the whole slew of billboard cutouts being remade rather than just a selection. Um, so this issue comes back again to the red and, and, the, and the yellow. And to my understanding is a lot of it has shifted towards the yellow, uh, to the yellow side of things, um, which is also why a lot of the um, paintings, that the billboard cutouts that were remade were eventually not selected and not, not shown. Actually, they were, they were painted but they were not shown um, in the memorial. And um, when I asked um, Gritaya Gari Wong what happened to, the, to those billboard cutouts that were not selected, um, they were just lost, even though they were commissioned and made and remade. Yeah, uh, which is really unfortunate. Um, and your question about towards a mystical reality, good thing we have Simon here, because <laughs> I don't have to answer this question. So, <laughs> anyways. Yeah. She, she was asking specifically about the NGS sort of like uh, hang, right? Is that right? Yeah. Oh, okay. So not 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 the right. restaging that I did. This this is an interesting exhibition towards the mystical reality because it's been restaged so many times uh, by different people through by different curators through the years. Um, it was restaged once at Balai, correct? Am I right, Simon? Yeah. And then of course, in a sense, a part of it at the National Gallery Singapore when we opened as part of our Southeast Asia gallery. And then most recently, uh, it was shown in Manila and also in Hong Kong. Um, so it has been restaged so many times. Um, each time is really different. But the National Gallery Singapore one um, was a kind of um, rethinking of it, because it's not the actual work that's being restaged, but working with Sulaiman Issa, one of the two artists, involved in the Towards a Mystical Reality, besides Reza Pia Dasa, because he passed away, um, to kind of re rethink and reconceptualize some of the works from Towards a Mystical Reality and restage it in the National Gallery Singapore Southeast Asia Gallery. So they're actually different works, but kind of referencing um, Towards a Mystical Reality, which is different from Simon's. So maybe, Simon, you can, if you can continue from here. Um. I think it was really just a faithful reproduction of the original, as, as faithfully as possible. Um, prior to this, we don't actually have the sort of complete list, uh, list of artwork, um, or at least um, based on a close sort of like study of all the photographs that are available of the original exhibition, a lot of the works are not um, 
are not sort of like subsequently sort of like listed, whether it's sort of written by Kanaga or uh, Serena. Uh, so I, it, that was more of an exercise to sort of as accurately portray the exhibition as possible in 1974, which I subsequently share with you, right? And you were going to create a model, am I right? Yeah. Based on that? Yeah. So for the National Gallery Singapore's um, sort of restage, mini restaging of Towards the Mystical Reality, um, the reason why we didn't restage it the way that Simon did, which was a kind of faithful restaging of the exhibition, was because of a copyright issue uh, with Reza Piedasa's family. So we couldn't get past the problem of working with, um, uh, because Piedasa has passed away, and to work with his two families, um, his ex-wife and his current one, um, to, to get their permission to kind of like re, re kind of stage the entire exhibition, which Simon has managed to do. <laughs> well, except the part that was about translation. It was the outline of the sort of local poet, and that work was still in existence. Nevertheless, we weren't able to sort of secure lo the loan of the work because of the fragility, the condition of uh, how the work looks today. So what we did was to sort of like, in each iteration of the show in Manila and in Hong Kong, uh, work with the um, exhibiting space to locate a local poet uh, in each locale in order to perhaps also um, suggest that uh, an important sort of um, uh, an imp important sort of like aspect of the exhibition is about this everydayness and the locality and how the poet right becomes that sort of uh, is a person who bridges these sort of like uh, the art world and the society. Well, well, I had a, a, a just a comment. I, I, Simon's uh, uh, lecture was beautifully written and um, and uh, very 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 nice lecture about a very strange story. <laughs> but um, it, I, I I couldn't help but think that one one point it makes is the fragility of the archive. You know, we we think that we're doing um, a good thing by bringing everything together in a single location, but in fact, it puts it in a potential position of danger if some terrible thing might, hap might happen. So yeah. now with the potential of uh, scanning everything and perhaps putting the scans in another location that um, perhaps is obviated, but it does um, uh, the law of unintended consequences. <laughs> it's a tragic story. It's meant to make you cry. <laughs> <laughs> More questions from the floor? Please, yeah. Um, 我想要问那个新友人策展人, 我想要问一下就是你今天介绍展人批判式展览那所以现在可能在东南亚这种的批判式展览是确实还是很常是常见的嘛那还有如果这类的展览它的有什么样的特点是可以让观众感受到的好谢谢您的问题嗯我从您第二个问题开始吧嗯因为这个这个展呢是artist Tate 我们就展出了我们的这个收藏 
这个现哎，当代当代当代的的美术史，所以唱，所以我们的作品很多是从我们的这个收藏里面，还有呢，我们跟啊、呃、东南亚不同的这个收藏家，嗯、呃，还有这个美术馆都借了他们的作品，还有印度，还有这个呃澳洲都借来展出，所以呢，可以说这个在 Tate Britain 的这个展呢 ，Artists and Empire， 它少，它就没有这个呃谈到关于这个嗯。这个殖民地，他们这个呃，英国殖民地的这个，呃，在在我们东南亚这一带的这个 impact， 呃，所以呢，我们关于这部分，我们就谈到了，呃，这个东南亚的艺术家，他们怎么样呢？去好像呃 resist 这个殖民地主义，呃，所以我们的这个展可以说跟 Tate Britain 很不同，因为 Tate Britain 呢，他们就是没有这么谈到。这个殖民地的这个反的一个啊、呃、方向，就是比较正面的方向走，对，嗯、呃，所以我可以说这两个展区有一个很大的这个分别，啊、呃，当然也是我们呃跟很多东南亚的艺术家，呃，跟他们就是 commission 他们的作品，这些作品都是呃比较比较有 critical 的看待这个殖民地的这历史，在东南亚。啊，这一代的这个历史，啊，所以这个也是一个很不一样的分别，因为在 Tate Britain 他们没有，就是跟东南亚的艺术家啊，就是合作。啊，然后您第一个第一个问题呢，就是问关于 critical exhibition 有什么分别，对吗？啊，其实 critical exhibition 最大的分别就是，他们不把观众呢当成一个一个一个 spectator， 他们把观众当成一个 participant， 所以所以他们很多的作品呢，就是。嗯、um, ，不要让，就是让这个嗯啊、um, uh, participant， 呃、uh, 有一个，让他们有一个不同的想法，就是 try to break out of 这个 Euro American 的一个一个 constraint， 去去去找这个不同，好像亚洲的不同思想的一个一个方向，呃、uh, 走，呃、uh, 这是这是一个，另外一个当然也是他们呃、uh, 很关注这个。呃，他们自己国家还是东南亚的，他们自己的一个呃环境的一个历史还是一个文化背景，呃，从那边就是作为一个根基，呃，才才就是从从东南亚的一个文化根基，呃，做这些作品出来，还是他们自己国家的文化根基，对，呃，还有很多不，还有就是他们就是发表了很多嗯、呃、manifesto。对，所以这些 manifesto 也是，如果您读的话呢，就是你会了解他们是很，就是反对这个，呃，尤其是美国还是这个西方的这些想法，啊、呃，他们要要找另外的一种想法来做他们的作品。对，谢谢。More questions? Uh, maybe just a follow up, Eugene, to that question. Like in reflecting on the term critical exhibition. At the end of the day, what do you think is ultimately deconstructed? Is it the critical or is it the exhibitionary? This is, um, yeah. So this is a this is a very good question, Patrick. Actually, I've not decided. Um, I will say both. Um, the critical in terms of the mentality, which is really changing um, the minds, mm. which is what towards a mystical reality is really about. Um, which is why I talked about the kind of aesthetics of decolonization. So a way of, as the critical exhibitions as part of this vehicle of this process of decolonization taking place in post-war Southeast Asia, but also in terms of exhibitionary, mm -hmm. like the Artist Fund of Thailand going out into public spaces, the movement away from the white cube um, as a kind of Euro-American paradigm, a way of showing art um, was kind of shifted um, by going to public spaces. So I would say it's both equally important. Yeah. For Simon, I was struck by the word <laughs> diasporic. Uh, diasporic. Why not, let us say, cosmopolitan or transnational? Why, why did you avail of the term? Large part of it is, uh, yeah, I did sort of consider these sort of like other terms, uh, but in the end, it was still anchored to a kind of imagination, right? Uh, even though that imagination was not clearly sort of like defined, which is like the condition of the Tamil Salonists, and there is this sort of like 
identity sort of like uh, marker uh, that is in sort of like constant sort of like tension in the way he's trying to build up this kind of like uh, icon in the way Raja Singham was trying to build up this icon. But it's never sort of clearly sort of like defined as well. Because uh, I mean, after all, uh, uh, for Kumara Swami, it's still primarily about, he's a scholar of Indian art. He's just, uh, in the end, he became a sort of like scholar of Indian spirituality. Uh, so there was also a kind of like, uh, a larger father India sort of like yeah civilizational you know, sort of like uh, desire it's like a, uh, some kind of foil to the civilizational right the diasporic tends to frustrate the civilizational at a certain level no? at a certain level okay yeah the national too yeah. obviously yeah so uh, maybe one more question before we call it a night. Okay. Uh. 这里, 这里, okay. 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 呃, 我们这个讲座跟台湾的关联性是什么的关系是很密切的艺术师觉得这个历史记忆的架构这样子的故事跟这样子我觉得这个其实会是一个很重要的像我们今天说档案嘛这个其实就是一个很重要的档案的意义在那边所以我想要请你在就是他在全球上面的这个重要性的部分再帮我多讲一点这样对不起我用英
and that's why I'm sort of like interested in seeing there might be certain sort of like tendencies, there might be certain modes in which you sort of like think or address the world. There might be certain sort of like paradigmat paradigmatic sort of like feature that uh, can be translated, that are translated across different kind of like cultural outputs. And that's uh, where I'm coming from. Uh, so it might not be doing art history per se here or it might not be sort of like looking at art specifically here, but I'm looking at more of like specific kind of like thinking that is also sort of like present in other cultural outputs. Yeah. Does that make sense? I know it doesn't, but I try. So I, I am. Thank you, Simon. So on that note, uh, please help me thank Simon and uh, Eugene for their presentations and for their responses to the questions. So thank you, everyone. Thank you.